Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 349. That's 349. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? Same old. You know how it is. We just keep trucking away. If you're tuning into the show for the first time via YouTube, make sure if you want to support the show, you smash that like button, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you're streaming it or downloaded it via the podcast app, of course, leave me a five star review and share it with your friends. And if you want to continue supporting the show and gain access to my entire library, as well as the full audio show a couple of days ahead of everybody else, sign up to my Patreon, which is down below, patreon.com forward slash Agostino. That's patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. For as little as $1, you can get entire access to my entire archive as well as a full audio experience a couple of days ahead of everybody else because everyone likes limited edition right we all love that we all love the one of 10 one of 20 one of 15 i'm giving you early access <laughs> ahead of the show for as little as one dollar click the link below in the show notes description if you do so please okay how's it going man um same old same old in it right we're all stuck indoors still any developments within the week that doesn't have to do with covid yes there is I've been listening to the new Brandy album, uh, B7, that just dropped, what, yesterday? And it's heavenly, really, heavenly. It's a really good reminder um, of the power of an actual R&B vocalist, you know? I guess nowadays, if, especially if you're, not, if you're not a fan of R&B, you won't give a crap, but the new breed of R&B singers are kind of in the vein of the Ginny Aikos, right? The, 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 sultry, the sultry whisperers, as they're often referred to. But you do sometimes miss those booming vocals, right? That kind of um, gospel-esque uh, tonality in the vocalist's voice. And Brandy has that, all of that and more. And the production of this B7 album is just heavenly, man. I just, I d it's hard to really describe. Like one way to describe it is that um, there's a track on it called Borderline. I think it might be track six or something, right? On the album, let me check on here. I think it's track six. It's absolutely amazing. I've been absolutely smashing it maybe for the last hour or so continually. Yeah, number six on board on B7 called Borderline. It just the way it's layered, um, the way she kind of croons all over it, and it's got that kind of you know, it kind of rem obviously it you can't say it reminds you of like a vintage Party Next Door, but if you're a fan of Party Next Door, the first album, and that sort of continuous kind of croning that goes on for a good six minutes, I re definitely recommend you check out Brandy, man. She's obviously one of the legendary R&B uh, songstress, but I think with the new age of people out there at the moment, Scissor, Summer Walker and stuff, you sometimes forget about the, you know, the stalwarts, the ones that actually laid their foundations down, and she's basically reminding everybody, hey, like i'm still top dog here and this album is a very good example of that man 100 check it out it's called b7 by brandy available now on all streaming platforms one of my absolute favorites so far what else i've been thinking about that hasn't to do with covid because covid chat is absolutely boring um boom, 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 boom. oh have you guys seen the new celine collection that was pretty cool right um hedis has gone for a bit of a weird phase maybe the last five or so years isn't it maybe maybe it's to do with his latter work at saint laurent or maybe it's to do with the fact that he's a bit of a dick to journalists and to people within the industry which i quite welcome right I, I do sometimes think these fashion critics can have a bit of an inflated sense of self right they can sometimes think they're actually bigger than what they actually are um and the practitioners the ones who are actually on the front line designing the thing and putting their you know career and reputation on the line by putting out six collections a year and hoping that buyers buy them and customers buy them when they're in store they're the ones that really should have a voice but you know sometimes you know it's what it is if you're on the sidelines you actually got no talent to actually cut clothes you can tend to think of yourself in a maybe an exalted way just because you know exactly where you actually sit on the totem pole so Hades means old school in that regard isn't it but he's also he can be a little bit petty you know you won't write you will write one bad review about him you slight his clothes you take a piss out of his approach you say he's yeah or you say his influences are quite dated and all of a sudden you're never going to see another show again right you're out of the picture completely so i can definitely understand if you're um if you're one of these what would you say if you're one of these journalists and you do get you know blacklisted i can understand being a little bit vindictive but no one can deny the guy's absolute talent in making clothes you cannot deny that 
and I think this latest collection with um, Celine that he presented, which was what spring twenty twenty one, menswear, um, was a, a reminder of just the levels that's out, that, that's out there at the moment. And I think it's also maybe because you know you always have to mention someone like this, but it's maybe a, a reminder to those people who are kind of don't really understand why some designers get stick like the Virgils of the world and stuff, right? It's because you unfairly compare him to somebody like a Heidi Samain, which probably you shouldn't do, right? You shouldn't really compare him to Heidi Samain because they're on two completely different levels. It's sort of like, you know, comparing him to Raph Simmons or somebody, but this collection was just beautiful. Um, essentially, I think it kind of, I forgot where it was actually, uh, where the setting of the actual runway was but he had these models who were tiktok stars or maybe had you know i don't think they're actual tiktok stars or they were influenced by it but mainly were influenced by tiktok for sure had them walking on the racetrack um outdoors with a sick soundtrack i think from some other kid as well who he discovered on tiktok he kind of took his inspiration from there it feels like he's finally moved on from the skinny indie boy kind of scenes the thing because I, I don't think that scene exists anymore unfortunately right that that kind of formed the big part of my youth as well in the early 2000s right listening to indie bands and going to gigs and stuff and wearing my swears and my skinny jeans and that was basically hedis amen's crew that was his um that was his um, pool of references or inspiration. But obviously that guy is sort of like aged themselves out in terms of being attractive enough to um, inspire or in terms of being, uh, yeah, as a basis of inspiration for someone like Hayes. I mean, he's always kind of seeking the new, right? The, the What's happening at, at the real ground level with the kids at the moment. So that generation of per persons probably aged out. They probably gained a couple of LBs. They've maybe stopped touring. So you need to kind of reinvent yourself and figure out what what the what is the next sort of like I don't know, what do you call it toy boy whatever. What's the next sort of it boy scene out there at the moment? And for sure you have to say it's TikTok, right? Those wavy haired sort of like front loading, no facial hair, um, you know, chiseled jaw looking boys are the ones you know that all the girls seem to go crazy about, and all the boys at those certain so at that certain age group also want to emulate. So it's no surprise that um, Hedis Main used them as a reference point and just the clothes in general. Like somehow he's able to mix, you know, eras, um with kind of what's going on now at the moment and it, they don't look weird in this that's the really interesting part of this that makes it really special Sama Hades I mean, is so talented he's able to make kids who were born in what maybe the early 2000s look amazing in clothes that were basically referenced from the 80s it's absolutely incredible to see and it's so everything in here and the other thing I like about Hades I mean, too design wise in my own opinion is that every place he's been at right he's always provided people with a template of how they could um, achieve the same looks um, with a far, you know, uh, far, with, with, a, with a small budget, right? You could go out there and complete this entire look, look to the cardigan, the summer shorts, a pair of boots. You could, you could easily go and thrift that or you could maybe get that in a high street store or get that from a brand, a tier below um, Celine or any house that Heidi's, Heidi's designing. And I think that's one of the best things about him. His styling is just out of this world. And, um, Everything in here in this collection is going to be, I think, desirable when it finally comes out in stores. It's just really magical to see like what it can be achieved when you're actually at the pinnacle of fashion, really. It's just all really, really good. I love the fact that he somehow made holes in the jeans a thing again because I've, I've kind of gone off of it. Um, I always thought it was a little bit try, not try hardy, but I always kind of thought it, 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 not thought, but it did kind of get a bit rinsed. I felt as if um, there was a moment where they were kind of, you know, they did have their moment in the sun. A lot of people wearing um, refurbished jeans or it's, it intentionally getting their jeans distressed or buying Japanese denim, then it can look pretty good. But then, you know, when you have in places like, I don't know, New Look um, doing distressed jeans, Jeans with holes everywhere and that you know now you have people wearing you know jeans that look like they, they haven't even been pieced together it can get a bit over the top but you know somehow he's done it in a tasteful way he's mixed it with a great outfit and it looks fresh again something now suddenly i want to wear it right you got here some great details with a trucker hat again jeans with the holes some great tailoring pieces which is always really kind of underrated not i won't say it's underrated him but most of the people kind of gravitate towards some of the bigger show pieces the hair and makeup is really solid and you know everything here you can replicate really easily but if you want to as well and you want to actually get the actual garment you can too the shapes are really great like that silhouette is great with the you know um with the hem of the trousers coming up just above the ankles to show off the white socks that pouch bag just really incredible really really nice stuff man the casting was out of this world the hair was great i think the 
Sarah Bronswell, whatever her name is or something. Is it Sarah? Whatever her name is from Bleach. I think she helped out doing the hair as well. I read on the review. So that makes a lot of sense. And just really greatly done, man. I think one of my favourite looks is coming up, I think, at the moment. It's like a poncho look. This look here, yeah. Look number 15 is definitely my favourite. So you've got this great poncho at the top here. I'm not sure what it's made of. Probably something very luxurious. Um, a great little earring, which is a great little nod to the TikTok boys, right? The idea that they have this, you know, bob, this really excessive hair at the top, and usually some sort of dangling accoutrement, right? Something effeminate. And they've definitely got their nails painted too, so I'm pretty sure you probably did that DL as well. And then you've got the great addition with the jeans, that this time not so much distressed, um, just with slits at the front of the heel. And then an interesting little styling tip I think he's done with all the jeans so far is that he's turned them up so they come just above the ankles and then you've got these um, trainers which I think are going to be very popular right they're sort of high top similar like a Jordan 1 with Celine on the back they're definitely going to be all over the place if definitely I'm, I'm assuming they're going to be very popular in stores uh, but that puncher look is one of my favorites and again another one as well you've got all the trousers with you know um, high hems and just great color blocking the use of patterns like this is one of the craziest looks it, this could easily be something from you know uh, a really niche japanese brand like i don't know like capital or something right you could easily see them do something like this it's just gorgeous man you've got these kind of leaf pattern on the trousers a great um what do you call that leopard print top and then the addition of a side satchel bag and silver which you know these little small things are definitely going to sell well in store you can see them getting picked up quite easily you know trainers backpacks hats bucket hats and stuff like this is you know out of this world stuff man he did really did smash it and it, and this is another real big change or maybe a, a little bit of a hint of what we'll see going forward in terms of um styling tips uh maybe uh, styling tips and trends going forward right? i don't like to say the word trends a bit gay but you know you know what i mean right styling tips in terms of what people will be comfortable to add into their wardrobe and i think this is a good addition i've always been comfortable wearing a skirt over jeans because i've got a couple of trousers from rick owens that have a kind of you know a built-in sort of skirt that goes over the top of them that looks really cool but it's it kind of you know it fits that look right it's all kind of minimalist and all black so you don't really get that many looks with it and if you layer it well with a t-shirt it can it can just look like an extension of a big t-shirt underneath but i quite like the detail on it but this is a really this is taking it a step above because you've essentially got a tartan um kilt uh, laid on top of some distressed denim and i'm not sure if the i'm sure the kilt comes separately and i'm sure not sure it's not part of the denim but even if it is the contrasting colors the contrasting patterns and the fact that it's definitely a kilt and it's got you know it's it's essentially uh tailored um on the waist it seems like and then it kind of bellows out towards the bottom so you get this really great little shape but it is it's a it's a real it's a real piece to actually try and work into your wardrobe but i actually like it i think it looks amazing especially tied in with this amazing base like you know, head head is something always makes great baseball jackets he knows to get he knows how to get that teddy boy cut really well done and again i'm sure stuff like woolly hats and you know zip up zip zip up hoodies and stuff like that will sell really well throughout the store you know in general there's stuff you're going to see a lot of rappers wearing and stuff but just great styling tips, stuff that you would you know generally mix up in here. You know, some pair of Dr. Martin boots, some Taekwondo shorts, similar to what Pharrell did. Great little cardigan again with the flannel. Just amazing bits and pieces. Again, these trainers are going to be so popular. It's going to be insane. They're going to be everywhere. So definitely wear. And they're, they're much better than what he did at St. Laurent before he left. Those sort of like faux Jordans that were out there. I think these look a little bit more interesting. They kind of remind me of these old school uh pumas i had that were like leopard print um this a similar sort of design kind of like a high, kind of like a, an extension of a mid top just above the ankle with the great sock you know blue and red stripes like just really tastefully done um yeah one of my favorites easily of so far that i've seen again great styling again look at this look at the colors you know purple with the nice blues and the yellow hues and then of course great great this is you know quintessential heidi in it like being able to somehow um take what's going on on the streets with these kids and kind of put it through his own lens right do his own little twist his own little reference of it like that's an incredible look for youth in it a beanie hat dyed hair glasses the addition of a nice kind of kooky earring piece the chain you know the the really rugged chain link on there on the top great layering baseball jacket distressed denim and the high top side you just can't go wrong really man really really well done and everything he's done here absolutely incredible the whole thing and again the casting was super great um 
it's a shame though because obviously you know it's because I think he they signed they recently signed a really big TikTok dude didn't they Celine so this is probably part of it but it's a shame that most kids you know that have the app probably you know most of the clientele that use the app anyway in general won't be able to afford this sort of fashion but I still think it's good for them to see what is actually possible and maybe just use this as a like I said a reference point in terms of what they do with their own wardrobe this is how you build it out in a really cool and interesting way there's loads of staples here that you can use you don't need to go probably maybe date yourself out a bit but I quite like like this this look is all me you know this great mo I'm not sure if it's mohair but whatever material that jumper is with some nice shorts th th that pattern on those shorts is definitely going to do bits as well when that comes out and these amazing army boots with the zip on the side like really really well done man even the styling tip of the helmet is really awesome and actually what it actually made me remind me of exactly was i think this might be um it is the main sort of like a um, this might be the collection that really takes Celine to the next level, especially menswear. And I think the same thing happened when Saint when he debuted his men's at Saint Laurent. This was maybe maybe it's up there with I don't know Fall Winter 2008 uh, Prada. That's another one of my favorites, like all time favorites. And this might be up there as well with it, just for what it did in terms of fashion going forward. I feel like this is probably maybe the most copied collection in terms of in recent history that I can imagine like every part of this collection was dissected and torn apart and done in their own version by every high street store out there you know this is the kind of reintroduction of skinny jeans really high distress denim uh, of course the zips on the knees which he obviously invent well not invented but brought to the forefront you know those jeans were absolutely everywhere the motorcycle jeans which you know Margiela did a few of them Balenciaga did a few back in the day Mugler did a few but this is what this is when we saw brands like represent all these other you know kind of um Heidi I mean, kids come up and maybe Amiri maybe came off the back of this too. Maybe Amiri sort of shifted towards of, you know, representing this sort of kind of like dusty kind of old school not or yeah, this sort of like dusty, reverent kind of LA rocker kind of um image. But it's easily one of my favourites, man. Skinny leather trousers, camel obviously the the Saint Laurent white boots that he brought out, you know, they, they, just designing this alone can put, can cement your place in the fashion hall of fame. You know what I mean? That Saint Laurent Wyatt went on to do absolute bits in the in the industry, especially within menswear. You know, everyone's got a version of a cool desert boot in their wardrobe, but I don't think you get any cooler than those. And of course, these this denim was a legendary one as well. The chain links, like fucking beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So I think that Celine collection might be as important as this going forward. You might see a lot of the stuff that they've that he presented with Celine kind of copied again into other brands. I can imagine Urban Outfitters grabbing a lot of stuff they did there previously, but this is easy up there, one of my favorites, man. I absolutely love this collection. Absolutely gorgeous. Everything about it. One of my favorite, favorite ones, hands down. I've got one. What's my favorite looking? It's the one with the red uh, flannel jacket, zip up sort of thing coming up here where can i find it da, da, da. but yeah this whole thing is fucking beautiful and of course the legendary teddy yeah this is it these are probably one two of my favorite looks the teddy jacket look of course the teddy jacket is everywhere now and um, you could probably get a couple of fake pairs from a fake version from zara or from h&m or some other nondescript korean brand but that jacket is just a legendary piece and then of course you've got this one at the end this is one of my favorite looks ever the, the the amount of times I kind of ripped this look apart and then did it my own way is just insane. So yeah, big up Hedis Amain, man. One of my favorite designers out there. Saint Laurent Spring Summer, like I said, 2021. Definitely check it out. It's available on Vogue website. I'll link it down below for you guys to see yourself, but definitely one of my favorites, man. Absolutely incredible. Like them walking around the track and stuff, like with the, they've got, they even had lights and little LEDs on their jackets when they lit up, like just beautiful. The soundtrack as well was interesting. I, don't think, I think that might be the first time I've ever heard Hedy Samane use a rap or hip hop in his runway tune soundtrack. It's usually always some obscure indie track or something, right? But this was really fucking good, man. I've tried, hit me here, let's hear a little bit of it. And I think I read on the, on the actual thing that the track's only like two minutes long, obviously, you know, it's like a TikTok tune, but he um, had to make an extended version of it, add a couple of verses. Let's just skew it up a little bit so you can see the close.
But definitely check it out, man. One of my favorite collections of the season so far. Okay, next on this, what do we have to get onto? Oh, of course, we have to get onto the most int the most um well not interesting or the most uh groundbreaking news so far in the whole podcasting land, especially in terms of the updates concerning the Crystalia story. So unfortunately, it seems as if the one Brian Kellen, one half of the Fire and the Kid, has been hit with sexual assault and misconduct charges right from you know stemming from a number of instances throughout the years and in light of what's happening with chris Delias, a part of you kind of thinks hmm maybe this was coming in it because i do remember <coughs> i think i mentioned it a couple times on here i remember listening to an episode with um joey diaz where he sort of mentioned a few journalists were calling around different comedy clubs fishing for stories about any misconduct and some of the ogs and it felt as if there was a concentrated effort maybe to if not if not to take advantage of the crystalline um takedown was to maybe it was a if not take advantage of it it felt as if there was like a concerted of effort to bring down the entire comedy store in some regard some people have hypothesized has to do something with joe rogan that the actual target is him as soon as the spotify deal was inked and maybe before that with the whole biden thing and you know him basically saying that you know biden is inept and he's not not current he hasn't got all these functions is that, is that always functions? What they say when people say that they're, that they're not really all there in the head. But regardless, right? He kind of was one of the main people in the sort of you know quote unquote mainstream to point out that maybe Joe Biden wasn't necessarily at all these powers to be the leader of the free world. And then we had the issue that some of the journalists had with him interviewing Bernie Sanders. So it feels as if like since then there's been a concerted effort to bring Joe Rogan down in some way, shape, or form. Right? They're kind of they're trying to make anything stick. Right? To try and bring him down and maybe the crystalline situation was a good chance to sort of jump on it and say hey you know you're friends with these guys and look at the stuff that they've done and by proxy we have to cancel you too now of course the benefit of being a jerogan is that you're uncancelable right because you got f you money that's why you do what he does that's why he's so incredible but you know because somebody off his platform somebody with his resources could be a little bit more um you, he'd be forgiven to be a little bit more of an evil not an evil person but a less reasonable person but i guess that's what makes him special in that regard but you know they're just it looks like they're making an effort to do it or it could just be the fact that you know they uncovered the Chris Alea story and then Brian Callan just came walking in through the door easily because reading this story you do feel as if he has no leg to stand on really and it's a really um I guess was I guess was the fire and the kid fans you're not going to be that surprised really it's bad to say that really as you know <laughs> that this story comes out about him potentially raping somebody and you shouldn't be surprised but considering how he goes on on the podcast and the way he acts considering he's a you know you, you know I think a lot of these guys maybe it's a lot of humor but you would I, I would imagine if you're the wife of a Callum prior to his divorce you wouldn't be that amused with the way they speak about women and the way they talk about being on the road it kind of does come across a little bit um, adolescent right it, the, the, they don't really sound like grown up sometimes so when you hear these stories you usually believe them because you feel as if like you know they don't really treat being a comedian as professionally as they should and they usually you know take advantage of any sort of the benefits that come with it and sometimes they you know overstep the mark in this case um, to a really really great degree so this is from the Los Angeles Times it says actor Brian Callen accused of sexual assault and misconduct and the stories here is by one Amy Kaufman said the following um, as soon as she saw um, his name Catherine Fior Tegeman broke out in a cold sweat her shirt damp she scrolled through the text message from her best friend alerting her that comedian Chris Delia was being accused of sexual misconduct by Scott's women on Twitter um, she'd never watched the stand up com uh, the comic stand up but she knew that he was a best friend of Brian Callan a fellow comedian actor and Callan she'd long told those closest to her had once raped her that is a mad way to start off the actual article god damn it lightheaded she dogs onto twitter um to scan the allegation she found that many of the tweets referred to not uh, referred not just to delia supposed misconduct but to that of his tight circle of male comedians she said my first thought was i something that happened with brian take him and record reading all the comments i thought here it comes i've known i've I, i've known how terrible this person is for 20 years and maybe i'm not the only one in a statement at the times kellen immediately denied raping tigerman and said that their encounter was consensual now that first obviously allegation is mad in it already right someone accusing you of rape regardless of the situation at hand is you know it's gonna it's gonna it warrants a thorough investigation but 
unfortunately, when you read the actual account of it and you kind of marry up Brian from what we know on the podcast and to some of the stories that he's mentioned, it does make some sort of sense. Now, again, it's an alleged incident. We have to go and give this guy his day in court. But considering what's happened to Chris Lear and also considering the fact that he was probably aware of this story prior to the Crystalia story maybe getting out there I reckon which is why they made a concentrated effort to sort of distance themselves from him even though he's one of their best better friends Brendan and Brian in that regard it really does make Brian Cannon look worse the fact that he knew this story was maybe you know in the works and coming out I'm sure the editor kind of called him for comment prior probably explains why Whitney Cummins took down his episode of of, uh, of her podcast too along with the Crystalia one so for him to go for him to kind of, you know, essentially distance himself from his, one of his best friends, knowing full well that he had his own story that, you know, regardless of whether or not it's true or not, he had his own issues um, coming up was a really bad um, misstep in his regard, in his case. Because let's, for, let's imagine a situation where he comes out and is a bit indifferent to the issue and says, hey, I'm just going to stick with my friend, like with Chris Lear's situation, right? Let's imagine Brian Callan comes out and says, hey, this guy's my best friend. I'm going to stick with him. Um, and I'm going to wait until more evidence comes out and then make a concentrated effort, but I'm not going to abandon my friend in their moment of need, whatever, right? Something really wafty like that. And it and then it transpires what's trans transpired now, where it looks as if Chris Lear isn't a pedophile. If anything, he's a creep, right? And then when your story comes out, you have, number one, you have an ally, a public one that people are aware of. People already know your stance and you can attack it head on. But when you distance yourself from you know your friend that was accused of something that didn't that seemed a bit shaky at first and then you have an accusation that seems you know banged it seems like you're banged to rights for the most part it does really make you question like who advice are these guys taking man like what advice are they taking and again deleting of the pictures on your social it's just all of it man you just think these guys like they dealt with the whole situation terribly but it also might be an indication of just how guilty they were that they were so nervous or so um clumsy in their approach to dealing with the crystalia stuff anyway it continues it says tigerman is not the only woman to claim that kind of was sexually inappropriate with her <laughs> Says since June seventeenth, the day that Delia started trending on social media, three additional women told the Times that they had been mistreated by Callan. Uh, Fifty three describing troubling sexual incidents, ranging from assault to misconduct to disturbing comments. Their stories suggest a pattern of behaviour that spans decades, going back at least to nineteen ninety nine. I love these articles, but she's being a bit hyperbolic. They're making him sound like a monster that was like preying on young innocent women for uh, absolute decades. It, it obviously isn't a fact. I think. <laughs> Apart from the one story that is a category rape, from all of them, the rest of them just seem like a very horny man, and that's what you get from read or listening to the uh, fire and the kid. You do get the impression that Brian will just about try and tackle anything that comes across him, which is maybe a, a, a lesson in this story. You know, of course, don't break women, right? That's abhorrent. You shouldn't be doing that at all. If someone says no, you absolutely back off and you go home. But I think for the dudes that make it late in their lives, having access or having, you know. Um, your star sun suddenly shining really bright it doesn't mean you have to take advantage it's, it's the same like um, opportunities I'd imagine so right you don't say yes to everything you don't say yes to all the gigs you don't take all the opportunities you have to be a bit selective because you, now you've so you've actually arrived now you don't need to be you know so willing and and open to do just about anything and your show shouldn't be open and willing to take advantage of every single encounter that you might um, have with the opposite sex it's not how that works Some, uh, it's a bit murky don't get me wrong in Hollywood I definitely understand that they there is a bit of a hypocritical tilt to it in that in one case you know you are kind of sometimes pushed to use your sexuality to get stuff that you want but then in other cases you have to sort of draw the line so it can be a balancing act to do but it, you can't be going around creeping on girls in shops and stuff like i mentioned in this article that's just like way way out of line but you know it's again knowing what i know about these guys on the podcast it should be no surprise it says here in the years since three women claim that the Goldberg sector they're trying to get him there everything and that's the thing it's offering him too he's dropped it again like Brian just about made it right recently in Hollywood he's been trying for decades right if you if you're a fan of the fine kid you'll know that you know he spent most of his career essentially being a nearly man right and everything right he kind of came into the game being told incorrectly that he was going to be the next Tom Hanks you know that does something in your head makes you think you know you're actually going to be the next Tom Hanks he's supremely talented as well don't get me wrong he can actually act legitimately he's got great stand-up um, improv skills are amazing so everything is there set up for him to actually make it in Hollywood but you know as with as with life you know certain things just don't work out the way you want them to work out so he suddenly gets his foot in the door off the back of the podcast that he didn't take seriously in the first place and now suddenly boom it's all over 
He continues, says the Goldberg actor continued to be both verbally and physically aggressive. An American apparel saleswoman said that in 2009, Callum pinned her against a wall of a fitting room against her will and began to kiss her. An inspiring actress who had four year affair with Callum while he was married said that he told her in 2016 that women are, have a biological primal desire to be raped. Of course, that line is taken out of context. We don't know what they're talking about, but goddamn, it looks bad. One year later, a female comedian said he suggested she give him oral sex in exchange for stage seven money. <laughs> oh these guys isn't it honestly this makes you just wonder like how why were they so quick to throw Cal- i mean delia under the bus like knowing this was in the works like like it just makes them look horrible as friends as human beings like god damn it when you know you have these but that i, I guess i sit in it i guess the people that do throw the most stones have the most skeletons in their in their closet right the ones that are pointing the finger usually have a lot to hide themselves but damn you man if I was Dalia, I'll be like, you know, that's that's karma. Um, to Canon Dalia and all these allegations, all these other accounts, sorry, he said, let me be very clear. I have never raped, forced myself upon any woman, nor offended, nor offered to trade stage time for sex ever. He said in the statement, I know the truth and I can only hold my head up high, remain true to myself and my family, my audience, and know that I will not allow the council culture to subvert what I know as importantly, and, and as importantly, what they know is the truth. Okay, fair enough. That That's, you know, commendable in that regard. He did come out swinging. He's not taking it lying down. But to suggest this is council culture is a bit, you know, that's a bit of a stretch. This isn't council culture. These, this is what these are accounts from women who say that you were a bit of a, you know, a bit of a creep to the nth degree. Being accused of rape isn't council culture. Council culture is, you know, you suggesting maybe all lives matter and getting absolutely rained upon on social media. That's council culture. This isn't right. Someone accusing you of rape is definitely not council culture. But hey, you have to fight your corner. And again, he has to do this, right? He's got no option. Because even what, what's, what's the solution here? He comes out and he fights his case and it's fights his case and maybe convinces some people that he was set up or that that lady fabricates some part of the story. People don't like him anyway, right? So I think they're looking, already looking, already looking to bury him just because of his association with Rogan or because of the things he said in the past. So there's no way he can win around. He can win those people around, and you know, when I show you the other bits and pieces, you'll figure out why. It continues, says, um, in recent weeks, Callan has come to defense of Delia. He didn't really. He said who last month he'd only ever had a consensual relationship and had knowingly um, pursued underage females. On June 8th episode of his podcast, Fire and the Kid, Callan described Delia as a ladies' man whom he'd never seen, heard, or engaged in illegal activities. And right now I have to believe that because he's still a friend. Not really, is he? We need to delete all these pictures on your social, mate. Oh, God. Despite that assertion, within days, Callan has scrubbed his Instagram account of traces of Delia. Previously, the comic had played up their friendship on the app where he had 900,000 followers about 1.4 fewer than Delia they appeared on stage together at the comedy store did stints on Joe Rogan's massively popular podcast and even closed a deal in the summer to make a prank show for Netflix the streaming network quietly scrapped plans for the docuseries after the headlines about Delia surfaced Jesus Christos um, and then it continues they said even Tiggerman who'd uh, tried who tried her best to avoid Callan since the 1999 was aware that Callan's relationship with Delia was part of their public persona and um, every few years she'd said against her better judgment she'd google his name and inevitably most of the searches links to Callan to Delia when Tiggerman first met him in 1994 Callan was not established as an actor and comedian um, he had yet to be cast in an inaugural season of Mad TV the sketch comedy series she herself joined uh, four years after his departure in 1987 he hadn't landed roles in prestigious television shows like Oz and Kingdom or scored cameos from his pal director Todd Phillips they're putting everyone under here isn't it? they're putting the pressure on everyone these articles are the worst man they absolutely ruin you ruin you because even if you bounce back from this right they've still muddied your name in the industry with all the people that you've sort of worked your entire Entire life to get near it to of course he's probably within reason if those if the allegations are true you know he doesn't have anyone to blame by himself but these articles absolutely bury you man god damn it it says it can and it would be years before he became a serious regular on abc family sip con the goldbergs playing a gym teacher and a coach who's later on one of the main figures in a short-lived spin-off called scored in fact tiggerman's father actor bill fiore gave Callum one of his first acting gigs <laughs> a role in the mid-90s new york theater production this is what i mean about this, these guys sometimes times and i think fair enough right if you're gonna be a bit of a pussy hound right and try and attack everything that comes in your way fair enough yeah you know? I, I, I think sometimes if you get involved in the industry you should maybe treat the people that you work with male or female regardless who you're attracted to with some with a bit more respect than you do randoms right there should be a bit of a unwritten rule that you there's a bit of a brotherhood sisterhood whatever it may be right that you kind of look after each other but if 
but if you're but imagine knowing that person in your industry trying to they're trying to make it the same industry you're in and then also knowing that knowing their father right their father actually hooked you up with a gig and then doing what's allegedly been done it's like come on man you can't be doing that Anyway, continue. It says years later, when Tigerman moved to LA in 1999, she ran into Callan at a bank and he expressed excitement at the prospect of showing the 23 year old around town. Because, like, on here. Um, so they became friends, meeting up at group uh, dinners and trading stories about auditions. That spring, she booked a television pilot and Callan suggested he take her out to a celebrated dinner at Chaya, the late industry haunt. This is where it gets sketchy. When he arrived to pick her up at the West Hollywood apartment, Callan immediately commented on her outfit. She said, I come downstairs in these dumb jeans and grey long sleeve shirt and he goes, What are you wearing? A bra for girls and wear bras, take it off and call Tigerman now. She laughed it off and they go into her car. <coughs> Inconsequential detail, but you know, they're sort of framing the story. At the time it could have been a joke, but when you read on and I guess this is the Tigerman lady herself. It says, at dinner, she ordered a glass of wine and excused herself to go to the restroom. By the end of the meal, she'd consumed only about half of the glass, but fell off, nauseous and disorientated. Now, I don't know if they put this in there because that's just generally how she felt or because they're alluding to the fact that he might have date raped her, which is mad. But again, once you put yourself in these situations, you are at the behest of these mad stories, isn't it? So she could be fluffing it a bit, but I think they're sort of leaving it in the sort of leaving it out for interpretation you sure interpret what you want from this right but mostly it looks like you know that they, they, they're they're sued they're set they're kind of pushing direction of if you know he kind of slipped something in the drink actually went to the toilet which is um still um when can just did they head to a movie theater after dinner she obliged back in the car he attempted to find a new stand where he could purchase a paper to look up showtimes but ultimately decided to stop at his house to do so you have to remember it's in 1999 so i assume they didn't have smartphones or whatever it may be but that's you know again that's a tactic for him to get her back to her crib which he essentially did he says at his home above the sunset trip the two sat down on the couch and callum began kissing tigerman she was uncomfortable and felt ill so she went to the bathroom which Again, I don't know how people read science. Maybe some guys are different. Maybe some guys think the more she recoils, the more it's an invitation to come on to you. But I would also always kind of um, lean on the side of caution and say if somebody's generally not enjoying your experience, you should just maybe leave and back away or let them go home, right? You shouldn't be trying to pursue it because, you know, you, you are allowed to have a bit of bias remorse. You know, I'm sure after a couple of drinks, some good chats and catch up with your close friend in the industry, there might be some desire there to think, you know what, why don't we take this at the next level? Why don't we actually seal the deal? Cool. But there isn't also the idea that once you actually sit down in a person's home and you get and you're familiar with their settings and you, you know, you maybe serve up a bit, you might think, actually, I'm not on this anymore. And it can be because I think most girls are aware that they, most people girls are conscious of not leading guys on. I don't think most girls are like that. Like, oh, I'm going to, you know, um, I don't know. I'm going to just keep teasing him. Most girls don't want to do that. So they're going to be kind. They're going to be quite coy about it. Not to kind of, you know, again, not to maybe piss you off or get on your bad side, especially if you're actually generally friends. So you, you owe it yourself to read the signs and be like, oh, cool. She's gone to a toilet during this sort of like, you know, my um, key foreplay stage that might be a sign that she doesn't really want to do this anymore especially when they come out and, they, and their vibe completely changes unless she comes out and straddles you completely and jumps on you that's a different thing but if their vibe completely changes they separate they push themselves away they go to the other side of the settee they start asking about where the nearest train station is it probably should lead them to go home she says yeah i remember looking in the mirror and being like okay you just have to tell him to take you home this isn't um going right tigerman said i needed to sit with him and have a conversation about how we were best buds and i was in love with another dude and again that's the issue isn't it? how are you going to someone else's house even if he's your friend when you got a boyfriend that's madness but hey uh but when she met from the restroom she said callum was immediately outside the door where he moved behind her staring her in the mirror he said look how hot you are you could be a playboy playmate and you could definitely hear him say that as well in your head and it said so that within moments she said she found herself in the bedroom where she pushed her down in the mattress as he ran his hands over her body she said she kept saying no in her mind uh, her mind drifted off to a crime scene she recently seen on tv in which a woman repeated her name aloud to abuse and attempt to humanize herself to him so i said i'm catherine i'm catherine it's me please this is not what i want to be doing right now she said and he's like you're gonna love this this is oh, jesus christ you're gonna love this we're going to go we're going to get this out of the way you're going to love this you're going to be my girlfriend if you watch Chief at K, as again, in a jokey manner, you could definitely hear Crank Callan saying this, but God damn it, this is not good, isn't it? This is terrible. Bloody hell. She felt powerless. If she screamed, she feared no one would hear her from his private home. She didn't think she could escape from under the weight of his body. So she checked out, eventually ceasing her, her pleading and remaining silent. 
God almighty. He said, this is not a kind of remembers the incident. He stressed to the Times that on Thursday that Tiggerman claims a rape are demonstrably false, saying that he had both agreed to have sex. Bloody hell, man. What's this bit here? It says, uh, um, da, 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 da. Tiggerman said that after the night encounter was over, she immediately began crying and searching for her underwear. Her bottoms had been thrown to the ground where Cannon's dog had chewed the holes in them. Noticing her tears, he tried to calm her down. She said, oh, come on. What am I? What am I? A big bad rapist? I'm not a big bad rapist, he said. Um, come on. You're going to be my girlfriend now. We needed to get this out of the way. <laughs> oh, my God. Cannon did not respond to question about this comment. It continues on here, and then I think the other one's the... So imagine, let's say, for instance, the issue he has here, if you're Kellen, right, if you're going to be his, uh, what do you call it, um, what, do they, what do they call them, disaster PR, dis uh, crisis PR, whatever it, that term is, right? The issue he has here is that this first story could be a bit of, you know, you could you could argue that you don't remember it happening that way and you know it's a bit of he said she said if you want to go down that route of course i think anyone accusing you of rape I, I, i'm not a believer that women really nearly go around accusing people of rape i don't think that's a thing there are some anomalies out there but i think for the few to go out there and do a whole photo shoot with los angeles times recount your story again there is some validity to it maybe you didn't maybe in, in in hindsight you probably think it's a rape and it didn't happen that way at the time but there's definitely some pain there about the encounter you had with that person so if you're Callan, you're gonna say cool i can maybe chalk this up to he says he said the issue he has is the other stories in context of this make him look far worse so let's ground down to this one i think this is the one at the store where it's like god damn it this is horrible but 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 was it green yeah so this is the one with green right um uh, the, 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 yeah, so here is so uh, as Callan Star Roses, uh, sorry, Rose, sorry, other women said his brazen behavior continued in 2009. Callan walked into an American apparel store in Pittsburgh. Rachel Green, an employee there, had no idea who he was, but her colleagues recognized him and pulled up an MDD to show her his credits. Which, you know, if you've worked in a retail store, you'll know if anyone famous comes along, you, your staff members don't know them, or your colleagues, you definitely whack out your phone or go in the store, till computer, whatever it may be, and Google their name and be like, oh, shit, that's so and so, isn't it? So it's a standard procedure. So the Actor, meanwhile, had ventured to the second floor of the store, an area that required employee supervision. I'm not sure if this was like a what, like a private stylist bit. I don't know. American Power had that, but hey, she said. So Green trailed him upstairs and helped him gather clothes he wanted to try on. He was friendly, she said, though they though he did emerge from the fitting room wearing only his boxer briefs numerous times. Which you know, knowing Callan's humor, you'd think that he'd do something like that, right? Again, I don't think it's appropriate, especially in someone's workplace, unless maybe she actively said, hey, I know who you are. You're a funny dude. You know, she maybe said some lines about his comedy and he felt comfortable enough to do that. But I still think, you know, you shouldn't be crossing that line at someone's workplace. It's just not on completely in it because, you know, you eventually get her in trouble. Anyway, even if she was game, you get her in trouble. The following day, Callan returned to the store and again requested Green's help, which, you know, pff, I don't know if that's stalking, but that doesn't look that great, especially if you have a major intentions known in the beginning. This time he was wearing a speedo. So he purposely went in there wearing a speedo and if his trousers are like, fuck me, Callan. Um maybe he was going swimming, I don't know, but this doesn't look good. Anyway, so that's what I was saying. So it continues. It says it was one of those um tight, gross little things she said. He ran out of the fitting room to grab something, so I went in to get clothes he'd already tried on. And then he comes in, pushes me against up the against the wall, closes the curtains and starts kissing my neck and as he asks me if I'm going to get in trouble, bloody hell! And again, we don't we don't know. There's obviously both sides of the story. This might be something else, but the issue here is that even if this happened and it was consensual, you still can't be doing this as a celebrity, as somebody, you know, as a public figure. You can't be going around to, you know, you can't be going around to American apparel stores in in the middle of Pittsburgh and trying to, you know, accost or come on to or trying to, you know. Um, trying to seduce you know the store assistants that work there because number one how old are they anyway right we don't know let's say they are of age or let's say they're really young like you know you're an older dude going into a store like that with young employees trying it's just it's just weird and it? it's just really inappropriate um he shouldn't be doing a third person even if he comes out and says hey this was actually consensual the fact that you're in the store doing this is just bizarre to say the least especially in context with the other story shocked green said she pushed Callan off her and ran downstairs telling her colleagues she'd been he, she just attempted to make out with her 
She said, I remember not really taking it seriously. Bloody hell, he's fucked. Most seriously, which is something I felt guilty about, frankly, for a couple of years, said Lydia, a co worker who asked that her last name not be used. Lydia is one of the two work co workers who told the Times that Green immediately told them something untoward had occurred with Callan that day. As I'd see him on TV over the years, I'd be like, that's really not okay. And I cried and I tried to laugh it off. Bloody hell, that is immensely bad. Kind of for stuff. So that was, and then the last one, I guess, is the one where he was having an affair with a lady but and then we've got here uh, Whitney Cummins is being thrown under the bus which is an interesting one too if you've seen the developments of Whitney Cummins she's completely like you know it seems like from what we've heard she's definitely distanced herself from that whole crew of lads but in conclusion it's definitely a wrap for a minute oh Tiffany oh and then you got the Tiffany King one right that was probably the worst as well that was the one where you know Let's see this one where it starts from. It starts from by the time so to yeah, kings each other incident. Let's go back up here. Yeah, so in the midst of the contentious divorce and fighting for custody of the daughter. Yeah, so it's when go. So no, you go here. But 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 where's King start from? Let's say here. I'm a rapist, fighting the kid, Callan, Whitney, Diffish. Cool, as there is. Oh, she's got the story too, Whitney Cummins, isn't it, right? Um this <laughs> Oh, he's absolutely fucked. I don't know what he's gonna do. Supposedly, there's a story coming out that he's gonna make. He put he put out a statement that he's gonna record a special T Fat K episode and kind of defend himself. But I don't know how. What he's gonna say is gonna actually change the narrative around this. But this is a part is really funny too. It says, "Um, Kellen, or you know, gross if you're <laughs> if you're one of his victims." He says, Callan often played up um, his reputation as a self-proclaimed dirtbag. In 2006, the episode of his podcast featuring comedian Whitney Cummings as a guest, Callan joked about how he'd been sexually harassing her since early in her career. Cummings then revealed that Callan had once asked for a ride home after a comedy show and pulled his pants and pulled his penis out of her in her car. He said he didn't remember the incident, but still believed her version of events. He says, my definition of creepy is that if I'm into you, you're not going to know. You're going to know it front and center. He said, it's when the guys kind of pull this gentleman thing and he he's being a really nice guy and then you look and he's got his dick out you're a real suit you're a serial killer be honest about your creepy which of course i've always been <laughs> that's a problem with podcasting you know you've got so many hours of people just talking you know comfortably amongst friends you know about their past lives or whatever it may be but then when you fuck up and do something when they kind of pull up the quotes it makes you look horrendous my issue with this isn't the fact that he said it say what you want to say the issue would be that if you're a comedian of his stature and you have a wife and kid at home, it's a bit untoward to be talking like this about how you would be with the girls and creepy and stuff because you're a married man. You know, you've got a kid at home. Even if you're doing it, you should just be, you know, you should be at least trying to present the image of some kind of, um, um, I don't know, some kind of maturity, right? Uh, an image of some sort of loyalty to your wife at home this would really put my back up if you again it depends what kind of partner you are if you're the kind of partner that, that doesn't give a crap and you think it's all entertainment that your you know your um your artist partner your creative partner go out and do whatever they need to do to so they can make sure they put a roof over your heads and feed your children and fair enough but i would assume you wouldn't be too happy hearing this and hearing them talk about this it's just not on um and you obviously wouldn't be too keen with him giggling about it's whitney cummings either and um, says it continues um though cummings was laughing as she recounted a story in the fire and the kid she also said she gleaned that callan was a type of guy who does not hear no a lot or don't listen to it you don't take it seriously god almighty says i'm a rapist callan said in jest of course it's a joke but going in a line that just looks horrible right saying that um i remember being like oh i'm going to have sex with him because he's not going to take no for an answer i'm going to do this and get him get him to go away said cummings on the show she declined to come in this article which then goes to show you why cat why whitney cummings was being such a you know, a, a bitch of the issue regarding it, right? She was aware of these whole issues. I think the story, she was aware of it. I'm pretty sure they probably reached out to her regarding both Callan and Delia when those when the Callan story broke. I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure she was probably mentioning it, which is, explains why she deleted the Callan episode of her podcast. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Spare a thought for Whitney Cummings, isn't it? What is she to do, really? Isn't it? Do you come out and throw your friends under the bus? which she kind of has done not really she hasn't really said nothing but if you generally haven't seen because i don't know sometimes you think sometimes it's a bit unfair the way they treat women in these instances right when they're associated with dudes that do stuff like this because what do you expect us to say she might generally have no idea that you go up to stuff like this right which i which i kind of doubt because i think that industry is too small not to be aware of what you're 
you know one of your colleagues that you've kind of come up in the ranks is doing but she's really in a between a hard and a rock place isn't it she comes she comes really hard at him other comedians will kind of look at her with a bit of a side eye and she'll get ostracized and then she'll be in the amy schumer camp of things who you know she went super ham on karen actually i'll probably switch that on there now this is amy schumer's um instagram post that she posted um which again is maybe an indication of where of kind of Callan's future that's basically done Schumer probably she represents the industry she is Hollywood she's definitely separated herself from that LA comedy scene and turned into a um, more of a I don't know what do you say a social justice comedian in that respect in the same way that Sylvia Silverman has so she doesn't really think that she owes any she has any loyalty to that crew at all so she posted a screenshot of the article and written here the LA Times just published this article by Amy um, Kindler about the repeat offence of Brian Callan thank you to the brave women coming forward and sharing their stories you're saving the women who may have come after you and to the comics who are annoyed with me for standing with these ladies what are you so afraid of of course, you know, she definitely positioned herself away from the stand up, says, Yeah, available on my number in the bio. If anyone wants to talk about Brian or anyone else who has sexually assaulted you at Brian, I have a nice day. Oh, brutal. And considering Brian Callan's wanting to make it in Hollywood for ages, and, you know, he's def this is definitely going to hurt for sure. It's definitely going to hurt. He continues here, says, Cummings was not only the female comic who remembers a uh, surprising Callan, so, so experience with Callan, Tiffany King first met Callan while performing on a comedy circuit in Hollywood. And though he is always touchy-feely with her, she counted him as a friend. He'd given her stage time before one of his gigs in Houston. So when she found herself down on her luck in 2017, she put his name on a list of contacts to reach out to. In the midst of a contentious divorce and fighting for custody for her daughter, emotionally you know, vulnerable, it seems like King had been seeking financial aid from colleagues at the time she was living in the Pennsylvania and saw that Callan had a show within within driving distance. When she arrived at Helium Comedy Club, she approached Callan and began crying as she relayed the situation. Oh, this already looks bad. So, um, he goes, are you on drugs? King said, I don't understand you, Tiffany. You're a really beautiful woman, but there's not, there's something that's always been off about you. You need to learn how to work with what you got. Now, this sounds bad recounting it, but that could have generally been like one of those sort of like um, creative moments, creative um, recommendations where you're like hey come on man you're in drugs like you should be more confident about yourself stop doubting yourself right Let, you have to work with what you have I can see that coming across well but when somebody's crying and they're emotional and they're vulnerable that probably isn't the best advice to give them right that's not really in jest they're not really in a jokey jokey mood um, so of course that isn't good <laughs> read it right when you read it back he said he declined to offer King managed to help but invited her to a dinner after his show. Um, she said they ate and then Callan asked if she could give him and his opening actor a ride back to her Airbnb. About 10 minutes into the des from the destination, she said the opener, who goes by the name of Stevie Blue Eyes but is legally named Steve Pearson, asked to be let out of the car which is odd but hey King said she obliged and continued down the road to drop off Callum but instead of going out of his vehicle she said he said she said he asked how about that blowjob? Bloody hell. I'm not going to give you a blowjob for stage time she responded he said no I'll give you some money too which I don't know if it's a joke or if it's just a really brutal reply to somebody who you would have thought was a friend it continues it said she rebuffed him and drove home in tears but in his statement at the times Callan denied ever offering to trade stage time for sex and Pearson an ex-convict um, who spent time in federal prison for selling drugs insisted that King dropped him and Callan off simultaneously we got out at the same time and went upstairs he said there was no separation she was never alone with her he was never alone with her so again man he says she said we don't really know but I think those two stories alone are enough to sort of bury him and then I think on top of that the main issue that kind of Callan has with this is is that the sentiment around him especially just around t k fans has really changed it feels like in the last few months or so right and most of it has to do with covid right the the way these guys dealt with covid really kind of for me personally rubbed me out the wrong way and sort of like turned me off i haven't listened to the show in four in ages right i much prefer to listen to the king and the sting stuff that um uh brendan does i kind of prefer that a lot more but this is a good little compilation that kind of gives you an idea of just how reckless they were um, in terms of dealing or talking about COVID on their show. Mm. I gave it to Chan. Where'd you get it, Chan? That little yeah, fish, dog. Let's hear it. Where'd you get it, Chan? Where did I get it? I mean, if we're doing the math, <laughs> it, it could have been Brian. <laughs> could have been me. And the screen here says day one, uh, 24th of July, 2020. You excited about San Antonio? <clears throat> it's 
Sorry. And that's before they're leaving to go to San Antonio, right, on their comedy tour. Dry cough. Brennan's giving him that weird look. And this is obviously prior to them saying that COVID is not a big deal. Um, Brian Brennan talking about the numbers and saying that it's only affecting a certain portion of the population. If you get it, you'll be okay. The governor's uh, the governor Newsom's overreacting. They were just really being proper cunts about it just because they wanted to get up on stage in the comedy store or go back to you know as it looks like going going on road and accosting random women in bloody american apparels over maybe but they, tr they just went about it so badly no oh, words lost my throat, throat yeah uh, but san antonio you can, you can bank on us being san antonio thursday friday saturday you're dang right you can you dang you can bank on us being san antonio thursday friday saturday you're dang right you can you're dang god darn you're right you're dang boy. goddamn right <laughs> we're excited and then day four, 29 for the six. We fresh from San Antonio slash Austin where I went to look for some property. He's wearing a mask so we can protect his health. Can't just shoot him in the fucking head. Taking the piss out of people wearing masks. Sounds Lovely. Good. Sounds good. How about that? Uh, me and Callan got the COVID test. The little no nasal Just got swipe. swabbed up. Papa didn't do well with Already. Brent, 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 the nasal no, I, don't do it. I don't like, like it. I'm gonna die of something, so you know, I just come. You do Brennan's now that? going yeah. to get an IV <laughs> that looks like a large bag of piss. <laughs> it does. Uh, what, what, there's a lot of stuff in there, huh? How many? How many steroids. things are in that? A lot of steroids. <laughs> and this is, and also imagine Brennan's being so um, dismissive of the co of COVID, but of course because you know he has the resources able to go to a private doctor to have numerous iv drips so if he's coming out saying that hey it's not a big deal um the sun defeats it i went for a 20 mile bike ride after being you know positive and not quarantined properly of course he can do that because he's got everything you know is in front of his doorstep to make sure it doesn't get worse but if you're not in that position imagine hearing these sort of guys talk about us this way vitamin c, and B12, B complex. Vitamin c b12 zinc magnesium papa's run down Run down, glutathione. run down. Glutathione. You're all, you're all run down. Papa's run down. Glutathione. Papa's run glutathione. down. You're all, you're all run down. WHO. Yeah, fuck the WHO. Okay. The guy had a rifle and the girl had a gun, and they're just kind of like, <laughs> nice cough. WHO. Yeah, fuck the WHO. There's no, there's no talking. I'm, I'm gonna have my AR-15. That's right. And you pass my gate, you're getting lit the fuck up. I agree. Bad boy. WHO. Yeah, fuck the WHO. And then, of course, day seven, second of I July. I laugh at COVID. Do you really feel fine? Ugh. I woke up all kind. Of, I've been for the past uh, since Tuesday. I was all kinds of achy, all fucked up. Jesus Christ! And of course, he passed on to producer. Shoulders and my neck. <laughs> you got COVID. Dude. <laughs> I probably. I don't know. Did you shake hands with Brandon? You got COVID. Dude. <sighs> horrendous human beings isn't it? and i think that effectively was what sort of sealed the deal for a lot of fans that probably were maybe not on the fence with all the hate that brendan and brian get lately but this definitely sent it over the edge man they i don't know i wonder what happens well, what turns them into these kind of people they were pretty decent in the beginning i really enjoyed it one of my favorite shows to watch actually the fire and the kid but over time it's just really, really gone downhill. It might be just the nature of their relationship has sort of changed, but bloody hell. But yeah, in context, you couple that with the fact that people don't like them anyway, and then this story comes out. I don't think there's any real situation that arises unless Callan has receipts or emails or he has a different account that maybe, you know, somehow you can, you know, slip in there that, oh, they were in a relationship and she used to live with him. I don't know what you can say that's going to discount any of those stories, really. Maybe, you know... Maybe you could just deny that you that it ever happened. You don't recount them. I don't know. But to save his career, I think it's, I don't know how that kind maybe his career is done in Hollywood, but in terms of being able to do podcasts, I think he'd probably be all right. The diehard t -Pat K fans might just, you know, not believe the woman in the story overall, but bloody hell, man. What a crappy situation for all involved. And again, it goes to show, you know, if you just would have stuck up for his friend, he probably might have been in a better situation. This, even if it was true, right? He might have had a bit more of a, he might have been given more of a leeway considering what's happened and what's transpired with Aaliyah. But we're going to be waiting with bated breath with what's happened with their show, whether or not it happens. I don't think it's actually going to happen. I think some, someone sensible will come in and tell them, hey, don't talk about this in, on camera um, until we get legal representation because, you know, it just isn't the right way to go about things. Even if he knows the, what the truth kind of is, I don't think it's a good idea. But hey, 
they've done much stupider things in the past. Anyway, that is the Excellent Zinger Show episode number 349. Thanks again for checking in. Um, little bonus one, just because of what's happened. Of course, lately I wanted to kind of speak about that. Again, if it's your first time listening to the show and you want and you like what you hear, actually, and you want to hear some more, you like what you hear, make sure you hit that like button, hit subscribe. Again, leave me a comment down below. And if you listen via the podcast app, of course, share, um, give me a five-star review and share with your friends. And if you want to support the show, you can do for as little as one dollar on Patreon. Link is down below in the show note descriptions. That's patreon.com forward slash Agostino, spelled A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. Show notes description for that link. And I'll see you guys again another time. Peace.